How you doing? My name is Kasim Brown, and I'm here to host the uh, Onwards Tour that we're having here in Pensacola, Florida at UWF in the Commons Auditorium. We're going to present um, a couple presentations today and basically have a great event today. Uh, I have Adam. He's going to present everything, and I want to say welcome to the event and have enjoy yourself. Yeah, probably not, but we're going to use it anyway. All right, we're good. All right, welcome, guys. Kasim just welcomed everybody. So my presentation today um, that we're going to be going over um, is going to be how I roll or my peripherals for you. So I'm going to go through my day-to-day -day kind of uh, environment that I work in, how it benefits me and how it can benefit you, give you some options, maybe some prices on different things. And just a lot of interesting uh, peripherals that I have found that works for me and help make my job easier. I know in the last few meetings uh, over the last day or so, we've talked a lot about tips and tricks, hot keys, um, mouse gestures, and a lot of things that can make you more efficient, reduce mouse miles, and uh, just make us better users, right, of, of the software. And so this is not only gonna help you with just SOLIDWORKS, it probably could help you along the, along the way with a lot of other softwares too, um, but we're gonna primarily focus on software. Um, just to reintroduce myself for those out there who may have not have seen it already, I'm senior designer and product engineer at Altec Industries, uh, adjunct in at an applied engineering department of Malin Community College. I co-lead the Western North Carolina Asheville SWUG group with Phil, uh, Phil Blim. Also the SWUGing committee member for the Southeast region and the Altec organizational SWUGs, SolidWorks champion and certified SolidWorks expert. So some key takeaways we're going to look at today um, is exploring my setup and my hardware, like I'd already mentioned, right? So we're going to look at that. Uh, devices that can improve your efficiency and incorporate devices and, and its software, right? Incorporating them. So this is my setup, right? Um, what was that you called me yesterday? An, an, an anomaly. An anomaly, right? Not an anonymity, but an anomaly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so... so I like that term. I like being an anomaly. I like being a peculiar person, right? And I think Tank probably, we share that same sentiment. So you can kind of look through there and some people look at it and say, oh, wow, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, I don't think I could function in that. I'd have an anxiety attack. Um, but for me, it works. And I'll explain some of the small tools that I use. I won't go through everything there, but I'll go through some of the smaller tools that I use that definitely make my job and my productivity a lot better. So we're going to talk about keyboards first. We'll just start basic, right? This is the keyboard that I use. It's a Logitech K350. Uh, it's just a simple three, uh, $35 keyboard, right? What I like about it, it's kind of ergonomic. It's curved, contoured for my, my typing and textures. Um, it's also got a lot of hotkeys built into it, whether it's for my music or for taking screenshots, uh, pulling different things up. I know I use Alt-Tab a lot, but if you don't know Alt-Tab, it's also got a button to pull up your different programs and kind of stagger those out by side by side so you can use them. And the main button I probably use the most is that calculator button up in the top right-hand corner. <laughs> I pull that guy up quite a bit just for whatever. Um, if I'm not on Excel or SolidWorks where it calculates things and does formulas for me, I'm using that calculator button. Um, but unless I'm typing, and I, and I love to say this because we've talked about hotkeys, we've talked about uh, mouse gestures and all those tips and tricks to help you be more efficient there. And what I like to preference that and add that with is unless I'm using my hotkeys and my, my gadgets that I have, you'll see here in a minute, I'm not touching my keyboard, right? Unless I'm typing an email, I'm not touching my keyboard, right? I'm all in mouse gestures and I'm all in my a macros board that I use, or even another feature that I just added recently a few months ago that's going to be very intriguing for you, I think. It's actually used for the uh, media and audio industry, but works very well for SolidWorks and stuff too. So there are other keyboards out there. A lot of people like these mechanical keyboards right and the reason they like them is because they got tactical feedback especially if you're a gamer right you know when you hit the button and if you're in an office with a bunch of people and you got a mechanical keyboard you're probably driving them nuts because they're hearing a 
<laughs> Tank and a couple guys in the audience raising their hand. That's Sam. They love those. I think they're great. They're good. Um, I'm just not that guy, though. I can handle just any keyboard, um, and that's simple one that I've got. It should last is great. What I like about this keyboard, though, right, it is a little bit on the expensive, more expensive side. It's a Razor turret um, wireless mechanical keyboard. Um, but it is 250, but what I do like about it is if you notice on the right side of that keyboard, it has a, a pad that extends out for your mouse. So if you really want to max, relax, and recline, and maybe link your computer up to your home TV on the wall, and, or some of those newer chairs that like lay all the way back and the screens are up on top of you right there, right? So some of that stuff could be pretty cool. And then that keyboard uh, has that mouse pad to, to come out and help you out there. Uh, here's a couple of other mechanical keyboards on the lower end of the price. They, they do a lot better. Um, I won't say better than the last one, but they do have some better functionality. They've got some, um, some macro buttons and some knobs you can use. Uh, this is also a Razer keyboard. Razer makes some pretty good products. It's the Huntsman Elite. It's only $80. It's a, just another mechanical board. It actually has a different type of switch. If you notice, it has the mechanical feedback, but it also in, incorporates a, a laser light. So it knows when it passes that certain point that you're gonna break that laser and actually know that that, that has uh, accepted your input. That's, that's, that's the one Tank uses. So everybody out there, the Tank's gonna give us our next presentation and that's the one he uses. You've heard from him a couple of times this week. And so it's been verified by Tank. We're, we got that, that's good, awesome. I'm glad somebody does use one that I, I showed up because um, having that feedback from somebody you know about a product is all, all that matters, right? That word of mouth. So, so yeah, that's a great one I, I pulled up and I heard about and uh, so it's a good one. Let's go to mice, all right? Um, not the ones your cats chase around, but mice for your computers. Um, this is the Logitech G700. This is one that I used for a long time. When it first came out, it was probably 60 bucks, right? You go try and find this, this mouse now, you're lucky if you'll spend $250. You'll have to probably look on eBay, and it could be even higher than that. Uh, it could even be one that's broken and you're having to fix it, right? And, and the reason being is they basically quit making this mouse. Um, but it's a cool mouse. Uh, it recharges. It has, as you can see, I'm wanting to say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight main buttons that you can set. Plus, you know, your left and right. The mouse wheel goes down left and right. And also, what I really dig about this mouse and another mouse I'm going to show you is it has the free spin function on your middle mouse wheel. So when you need to go zoom into something, almost like the space mouse, instead of zooming in and having that click, click, click and trying to get past that or for a web page if you're reading a document, you simply spin that mouse wheel and it'll spin like it's on a bearing, then it'll just roll and you don't have to worry about it. It'll zoom straight in real quick, it'll zoom straight out real quick. So that's what I really like that mouse wheel for, where it uh, has the opportunity to, you can either A, make it a free spinning wheel, or B, give it a little click spin to it as well. So it's totally up to you. As you see the three lights on the side, that's not only a battery indicating light, but what else those lights do for you is you can set up profiles. Now, I'm trying to remember how many profiles you were able to set up. I don't think I utilized them to so many. I know you have the three that's on it, but you actually have even more than that because you would have one light for, for one, two lights for two, and then three, and then actually went to like one and three was another profile. And so it had a little bit of different profiles you could do, but it's a great mouse, uh, loved it. Again, it was rechargeable. You put in the, the white uh, rechargeable batteries, the Mac Daddy ones, I can't remember what their name, they're beginning with a P, I think. Um, but yeah, so that's a great mouse. Um, sadly, I recently retired mine. Um, the problem was, is after you use it so long, and I know I'm not the only one guilty of this, but eating Cheetos and drinking drinks while you're working and all that stuff winds up getting underneath and the buttons get a little sticky and then you're like, beating on your mouse, stop clicking or click or do whatever I need you to do, right? So I uh, retired that guy. <laughs> Here's a couple other Logitech mice, uh, or another Logitech mice. It's a G600, it's only 40 bucks, right? It's still out there. It's got a lot more buttons on the side of it. Um, I don't think it does the free spin. It looks like it might, but I don't think it does. Um, it's got the three mice button. So if you're into the three mice button, like uh, Tank's uh, 3D connection mouse that's sitting right here, I'm showing you, um, that's a great mouse too. So it's similar to that, but I'm a big macro button kind of guy. So I like the macro buttons on the side. 
my thing is is if you're if you're trying to think of dexterity are you going to be able to feel which button you're at and where you're at so you got to think about that too um just like a keyboard if you're looking at your keyboard sometimes what is it your h button or no your, your j and f button have the the little raised pieces so you know where you're at on the keyboard right that's got some indentations that might help you with that um it's only you know what three across and and four deep so uh, you can probably find your way around it. It just takes used to getting used to. And and when I say that, it goes back to the premise of what we talked about in our original meeting um, a couple meetings ago when we said, or when I invited you and Tank invited you to take one concept from any one of these meetings and apply it, right? And so if you do that, you can eventually work it out. And I'll explain that a little bit more um, when I show you the macro pad and how it worked into that. This is the one I use currently. This is the Logitech G604. It's not as expensive as the uh, as the $250 one that I actually, you know, I bought a couple of times. Um, now I can't hardly find them. So I went to this. It's a good replacement for the other one. The only downside I would say to this one in comparison to the other one um, is the profiles maybe. You don't have as many profiles. You just have the one set of profiles you can use. Um, but I really like the rechargeable feature. Right, I can plug it in at the end of the night, come back the next day, unplug it, and I've got a full battery. It does last batteries pretty long. I don't think I've changed the battery but once on this since I got it. I probably got it about six or seven months ago. Um, so it does work pretty well. You notice it's got six buttons along the side. It's got a plus and minus button along the front. A lot of those come preset for you, um, but you can change them. Right, A lot of Logitech stuff that have these macro buttons on them, you can change them and customize them to what you want. I may even pull that software up here in a moment, just kind of give you a, a little look at how you do some of that. It's very simple, it's plug and play, it's, it's great stuff. It's a great way to, to um, break the ice if you don't program macro buttons or anything, it's a great way to break the ice and just kind of plug and play with some macros. Great mouse, uh, it does have the free spin option. So you notice it's got the buttons in the center. Um, one of them will actually unlock the mouse wheel so you can free spin or click spin either one. So again, that's when I first, when I look for a mouse, the, the two biggest things I look for is does it have macro buttons and does that mouse will free spin? <laughs> Here's another mouse. Uh, I had a buddy at work pick one of these up at World a few years back. Um, there's a few different styles of them too. I'll, I'll show you a few different ones. Actually, he picked up that one. So this is a different one um, that he picked up. We'll get to the one he picked up here in a minute. Uh, but it's great. It's supposed to be more ergonomic. It, it positions your hands more in an ergonomic spot where you're not just flat and worried about your carpal tunnel syndrome or anything like that. Your hands tilted up a little bit more. And they say they glide really well. It's got a few macro buttons on it. It's a Logitech as well. It's running about $90. Um, but yeah, it, it could be potentially a good alternative for those that have wrist issues um, that need a little bit more comfort or need something that's uh, more ergonomic to, to the way they, they hold their hand while they're working. The next one, this is the one my buddy got um, from work uh, at World a few years ago. Uh, this one is actually adjustable. So the other one was preset. If you look at it, it was uh, the other one was preset with what a 57 degree angle, right? This one you could actually adjust. To what you wanted the angle so where did it actually fit your hand and the way you hold your hand i think he when he used it he ran it just straight up and down almost like he like a pistol grip almost um and i think that worked very well for him he used it for a long time i spoke with him about it recently he said he wasn't using it anymore he had went back to something else but he said when he did use it he liked it notice it has the three buttons on the mouse too just like the old mice do just like this 3d connection does just like the last one or a couple ago i showed you it's got a couple macro buttons if you're if you're into that maybe just use it as a back and forth i'll go back and just give you a couple ideas of what i use with mine is like that plus and minus button i create that as my copy and paste right how, how many times do we copy and paste things yeah sure we got control c control v but now i'm taking this hand reaching it all the way to my keyboard and holding control 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 c control v again we're talking about my, mouse miles what about hand miles right how where are we moving our hands to constantly throughout the day um so if i'm able to just hit a button on my mouse where my hands already at that's a win for me right we're, we're reducing waste there um because robinson in the chat says the logitech mx anywhere also is good enough too Logitech's MX anywhere? Yes. Okay. Two and a three and they're smaller for people with smaller hands. Smaller hands, yeah. I got I got soft chance. Big hands. The Razer Naga 
each of the darker side panel so that it has the three by four or it has a circular one that has eight buttons and then there's another option that just does three. So you can switch out that Razor Naga Elite. Yeah. Okay, and, and Range, Gentleman in the audience says it's about a two hundred dollar price range, and what's really cool about it, it has macro buttons. You're saying, and there, it's a panel that you can change out and have different sets of macro buttons. That's pretty cool. I will look at that. Um, do you mind typing that in the chat so we have a list of that? I know it's going to be recorded, but the Razor Naga Elite is another one. So, and it's roughly about two hundred bucks. You said um, so. Those are two great op opportunities. I'm glad we're, we're talking and, and mulling through this because. We've said, we said this yesterday quite a bit, right? You put 100 designers in a room, they're going to design 100 different ways. Well, same way with our operating systems and our peripheral devices. That's why, you know, our mind works for you. Um, and many people have different ones. And it's great to, to conversate about these things and, and know what other people are using because otherwise we're pigeonholing what we're doing, right? That's why the slug groups are so great because we can, we can get, get together and have some camaraderie, rub shoulders, have some networking and, and see what other people are doing around the world. So let's skip through. We I kind of backed up just to look at a few other ones. All right, now we're going to talk about macro pads. This is my baby, right? This is what keeps me from touching my keyboard. And we just talked about mouse miles and hand miles, right? I kid you not, uh, for, for those that can kind of see me, I'll put my hands up here. The keyboard's in the middle. My mouse is on the right side. My macro pad's on the left side. My hands while I'm working, okay, call me lazy, whatever. I've, I've also heard that many engineers are lazy, and that's why people that are lazy make good engineers because time is money and money is time, and we find the quickest route to do it so we can save the company the most money and time, right? Um, so my hands are right here all the time while I'm working. I've got one hand on the macro pad. I've got one hand on the mouse, and I'm doing this number right here, and, and you know, kind of patting my head and rubbing my stomach at the same time. <laughs> but, so that, that's basically how it worked. And I, and I really don't move my hands from that unless, like I said at the beginning of the meeting or at the beginning of the presentation, unless I am typing an email or a chat, that's when my hands shift, right? So I'm pretty comfortable. I'm pretty ergonomic. I'm kicked back. And I'll be honest with you, because of the way I work and the simplicity of my working style, my older son, whether good, bad, or worse, right, um, went from thinking he was going to be an orthopedic surgery and sports medicine to seeing when I came home to work from home during COVID and I'm still at home during now, we, we have a rotation of every fourth week right now, but him and his buddies come in there and like, dad, you just look so cool and comfortable doing what you're doing. I'm like, yeah, that's the way I roll, man. He's like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm like, thanks. I'm glad I was able to encourage you, son. So now he's switched over. He's wanting to do engineering and a lot of his buddies are. Um, and it's funny because, I think he told me one time in his drafting class that his buddy was sitting next to him. He said, look, I'm your dad. And he's just kicked back and <laughs> make, making his posture like mine. So, so that's pretty cool stuff, you know, that we're able to encourage others to, to grow into the generation of engineering, right? What's cool about these macro pads, as you've seen in the mice, they had buttons on the side or on the top, right? Well, this has got a, a plethora of buttons. It's the Razor uh, Tartarus. It's 65 bucks, so it's a good entry-level one, right? And each one of those buttons are customizable, right? So forget the hotkeys altogether. This is why Brad was, was all but cussing me <laughs> yesterday when he was using my computer because my hotkeys are not the same as what everybody else's hotkeys are. Why? Because I was able to duplicate and triplicate functions through the macro pad, right? Let me uh, think my uh, camera just shut. All right. Um, so I was able to duplicate and, and replicate different functions based on different button maneuvers within the macro pad. So my hand's sitting there and okay, I've got copy and paste on my mouse. I've got uh, control and shift on my mouse. I've got, you know, uh, I won't say a couple other ones because if you find them, you might be able to get into some of my stuff. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the other ones on the, on the left side, you know, those, those are my copy with, uh, yeah, copy with mates, right? I've got uh, my breadcrumbs, my save functions, um, I've got control and shift buttons there. You notice this has got a joystick on the right-hand side. I'll show you my macro pad that I use on my joystick. When I move it to the, to the left, it's control. When I move it to the right, it's shift. So I can have that on both sides in my mouse and in my, my left hand. So I can have control and shift in my left hand. If I push it up, it closed down one window. If I hit a button next to it, it closes down the singular window and not just the application. So the up button closes the whole application in the, in the, 
and the uh, joystick. But if I hit another button, instead of closing the whole application, I'm only closing the single instance inside of that application. So it, the, it's, the possibilities are infinite and it's only limited to your mind and what you do. That's why I mentioned in the earlier meeting yesterday that as you do things, as you, you push a button on the ribbon, remember what that is. How often are you pushing that? Do I have to travel those multiple times? Let's reduce those mouse miles, put them on a, a mouse wheel, put them on a hotkey. Now we can put them on a macro pad, right? How awesome is that? We'll go ahead and go to the next one. This is the one that I have. If anybody noticed in, uh, in Brad's presentation yesterday or last night, he talked about uh, I'm lazy, All right? What was your title again, Brad, I'm lazy? I'm lazy. I'm lazy, yeah. If you notice in his pictures, he went through uh, several pictures of keyboards and mice and space mice, 3D connection opportunities. And uh, if you looked in his pictures, he had a picture of this. He actually asked for my, myself to take a picture and give it to him so he could, he could apply it to his presentation. But now this is a while back when he did that. What, one thing, I'll, I'll give you a little tip and trick about just this and, and 3D space mice. We seen Brad get last night talk about the three different types, right? You got the, just a normal little space mouse, and you have the next one up that looks a little bit like this without a screen. Then you have the top notch one, three, four hundred bucks, you said, Brad, something like that. And it's got the screen and the space mouse and the buttons on it, too. You can take this guy. Now, actually, yeah, you can take this guy and run the, the cheapest small space mouse and sit it in the notch of this corner. Let me see if I can get my pointer here. Sit it in this corner of this notch, and you basically created your space mouse with the screen and everything else at a cheaper price. I've done that, and it works. I talked about the joysticks, and I talked about the, uh, the, different, the different buttons and how you can program them. One thing I like about this, uh, that, that's very unique, I think my mouse does the same thing, is it can be program specific. So notice it has different profiles. Even along the top here, you can see there's different profile buttons along the top, right? And you can record macros uh, as well with it. So if you get into it and you want to record a macro or a, a mouse movement or click or whatever, you can record it and program it into a button. But you have different profiles. But when I say program specific, it's smart enough and intelligent enough that if you tell it this is SolidWorks or you tell it this is Internet Explorer or this is Google Chrome or uh, this is my uh, emails, or if you use Teams Messenger, this is my Teams Messenger. And you can say, when I'm in that instance, or when I'm using that program, or that program is active, I want my macro buttons to be this, right? This sounds like a bit much. It sounds like, wow, look at all those buttons. I'll never remember those amount of buttons, right? That's too many for me. It's just never going to happen. You know, I probably thought the same thing when I first picked it up, but we go back to at least try one thing incorporated in your daily life right and if it's a win it's a win if it's not toss it out with this you start with one button it could be your save button it could be your copy button it could be your linear pattern button but program one button once you get that muscle memory of that one button add another and then add another and then add another and eventually your muscle memory is going to remember where that's at i know i had some people they would do about four or five and that's fine too and with some of this stuff, you can just do a print screen and print it out, maybe put it at the bottom of your computer screen so you know where those buttons are too. And, and again, as you do it and as you build into it, you're going to recreate muscle memory and know where those buttons live. And then as you do it for SolidWorks, then do it for Outlook, right? And then tell it to switch off uh, programs. So now when you go to Outlook, you can say, okay, mark is unread, mark is read, reply, send, you know, if anybody doesn't know, it's control, control enter will send an email from you for Outlook. We'll just put that into a button. Now you don't have to hit two buttons, you hit one button, and your hand's already there, All right? So that's pretty good stuff. Um, Logitech uh, gaming software. So this is where I'm going to pull up some of this Logitech software. And the, the macro pad here uses a gaming software. Now, a mouse uses what's called Logitech G Hub. I don't know what they did. Maybe it's just more recent. Going back to the, the gaming pad that uses the gaming software, uh, the macro pad, it, it's about 100 bucks. You can find it, kind of find it. It's actually becoming obsolete as well. Um, just like that first mouse that I loved and I can't get it for cheap anymore, this is kind of running into the same issue. That's why I showed that Logitech um, 
the other Logitech, or sorry, Razor macro pad at first, because that's probably one I'm going to switch to when this one eventually dies. Um, but when we talk about that software, I'm going to go ahead and pull some of it up. So this is the gaming software here. And you know what? It's not going to actually let me do it because I don't have my macro pad with me to show you. Let's see if the mouse one will let me do it. Yeah, so I don't have the gear uh, on here. So it's not going to let me show you. But uh, it is great stuff. It's really easy. Again, you go in. You, you pick the button that you want to use. So let's say you select uh, that copy button, right? I had a plus and minus sign. So you select them. I want this plus button now to be copy. So you select the button, you go to the, the key function and you say control C, you can select it. Some of them even have boxes or where you can just pick it with your mouse. Some of them will let you actually input it on the keyboard and, and read your keyboard. Um, and then now that button becomes copy and you do the same for any other one. Uh, when you when you run your hotkeys and you're in SolidWorks and you look at that list of hotkeys, you can look at that list of hotkeys. I'll actually go to that real quick for you. That says it's PowerPoint. Maybe I did. Okay, so let's open it real quick. That's where I open it. I don't know. Let that open up in the background. Okay. Yep, so and I'm gonna show you real quick um, in the hotkeys, you can actually filter that down to any hotkey that's already programmed, right? You can look at anything that's not programmed, you can change it and say, okay, what is programmed? And then once you do that, you're able to make a, you can actually print that list out. So print that list out, print that list out and then use that to help program some of these keys, all right? Um, that could be very, very beneficial for you. Let's see what my time is here. All right, so here's my next thing. This is my, my next big wow, right? Um, I found this probably six, six to eight months ago, right? I don't know how many people know of Stream Deck, but Stream Deck is another type of macro pad in a way. It's anywhere from $800 to $250. And you can see in that price range, it, it graduates by how many buttons you have, right? So it's basically a little box. Um, the cheapest one that's 80 bucks, you can see it's got six buttons. Now, what's cool about those buttons is, let's say you have that macro button on the left side and you can't remember what G10 does, right? Macro button G10, maybe it's supposed to be your copy or your paste, you can't remember that. What's cool about these buttons is each one of those buttons is a little LED screen. You can actually input pictures into its spot in the software and say, this is my copy button or this is my copy with mates button, and it shows, all right? So now you don't have to memorize what G10 is. Now you know what the button is because it's got an image for you. Just like that one on the left, you can see what, what is that lower middle button? What do you think that is? Probably for some sort of messaging, right? <laughs> yeah. So you can, you can make those buttons show whatever you want, just like a little LED TV on each button. What's even cooler, so as, you, as I was saying, it increases by size and increases in price. And you can see we get these bigger ones, 250 bucks. Um, what makes this device even cooler and blows it out of the park when it comes to macro buttons is let's say the top left hand button was outlook right that top left button hit it and it's going to open up my i can tell to open up outlook for one or make outlook um the application that is now um in control on my pc right versus whatever else i'm actually looking at but looks at your executables right hit that hit the outlook button and then the buttons change to what's in the Outlook environment. So each button has sub buttons under it and will change the buttons that you're looking at. So let's say we go to SOLIDWORKS. Let's say we hit the SOLIDWORKS button 
And now all the buttons have changed to be SOLIDWORKS function buttons. That's what makes that awesome. But it's expensive. For me and my taste, too expensive for what I want to do. So in my search, I said, what can I do a little bit better? And I found a program called Touch Portal. Touch Portal was free. Okay. You can only, on the free version, you can only get about 15 buttons, I think it is. It runs across Android and Apple devices, right? I boot, say I bootlegged, right? I didn't really bootleg. I went in and did um, developer options within a Amazon Fire tablet. Amazon Fire tablets run on Android. Right, so I went into Amazon Fire Tablet. I did developer options. I side loaded the Google Play Store, right? Because you can only get the app for this through the Google Play Store or Apple Store. And when I side loaded the Google Play Store, I was able then to download the Touch Portal. Now, when I said it's free, it's free for about 15 buttons and I think one page. They call them pages. Or so when you hit a button, like I said, when you hit the SolidWorks button, then it changes all the buttons to SolidWorks functionality buttons. That's because it changed the page. Right. Um, so with this, if you want to have a plethora of buttons, a plethora of pages, I think it's almost unlimited. I can't remember exactly how many. We'll go in here and look at it. Um, $12.99, one time fee for life. You have as many pages and buttons as you want to play with. You can look on the left hand side, that's that screenshot on the left side. That is my Zoom page. I can go in there, I can leave the meeting, I can share my screen, I can pause something, I can mute my mic, I can go home. And one thing you gotta realize is anytime you create these pages, you need to always have a button that links you back to home, otherwise you get stuck in a page. You'll figure that out really quick when you can't get back to your home page. Um, so always have a home page. Um, but yeah, and what I did in, in every one of my applications, I put a center button there. So what's that center button look like? It looks like the Zoom application, right? So if I hit that button, it launches Zoom for me, right? So let's look at Touch Portal. Let's just go check that out real quick. Huh? Not at all. Now there is one thing I should preference with between Apple and Android devices. Apple devices, your computer and your Apple device have to be linked to the same Wi-Fi because they connect through Wi-Fi. Android is the same way, but Android has one step further to where if you plug it in with a with a USB cord, which I, I like better personally, that's why I use the, the Amazon Fire tablet. Actually, what's funny about it, last Christmas for our Christmas present from out, my company, Altec, they gave us these Amazon Fire tablets. I had Samsung tablets and everything. I'm like, what am I going to use this for? You know, and I was like, hmm. I've got a use for it, right? So I turned it into my touch portal. And then when I turned it into my touch portal, I said, oh, well, Android's one step better because now I can plug it into USB and have more of a hard connection. But not only do I have a hard connection, I'm constantly charging it too, so it never dies on me. Right? So this is touch portal. Um, you can see what it was said. A lot of these, these stream, uh, stream Deck and touch portal, a lot of this stuff was used for YouTubers and media people. That's why OBS, if you see this little Ninja Star looking thing, I love OBS. It's a great application to use for streaming things and, and changing windows. Or if you're trying to do a podcast for somebody, it's just like, it's like having a, a studio on your PC where you can switch out different um, screenshots and you know, cameras and mics and all that. It's a great, great application. Um, so, so as you can see, a lot of this stuff is that way, right? Um, as well as Photoshop and a lot of other things. It's got TikTok and um, I think my son actually tried to use it for some of his stuff. But you can see how this works. So multi-action macro buttons, right? You're customizing these buttons with icons and colors and text. So now you're no longer guessing at a macro button. You know what the macro button is because it's got a picture. And guess what the picture is? What you choose it to be, right? You can, and if you really want to get fancy like I did with that, uh, the Zoom window, right? You can put backgrounds in there, make it look pretty. You can make your icons different. You can put windows around your icons. You can do all kinds of fun stuff with it. Yeah, right? exactly. You probably can also download the solid icons. If you want to talk more about it, Tank, I've got some really cool stuff where I got it into Active Workspace. <laughs> and it does a lot of like workflows and stuff for me. <laughs> um, and so I'm, I'm looking into that, Tank, because I talked to Dusty and it's something that 
I think could be big. We just got to make sure it's going to work for other people in the company. Um, so yeah, colors and text, you change the buttons to what you want, add actions to your buttons to do all sorts of tasks. Create macro buttons by adding uh, and multiplying actions, make more complex executions with logic functions. So you can do if, and, and these statements in it. You can do if it's this, turn to, okay, so for example, with, with Zoom, if my mic is, if I hit the mic and mute it, I can turn it red. If I unmute it, I can turn it green. You can do all these logis logic buttons that, that change things. You can do sliders, right, that increase volume and decrease volume for, say, your audio apps and stuff, right? Um, it is also application dependent as well. If you so choose, just like the other one, you can say, if I'm in this environment, if I'm in SolidWorks, do this. If I'm in Outlook, do this. If I'm in Zoom, go to my Zoom, right? And it works great with Teams and stuff as well. Yeah, make those complex with Logitech, add buttons, uh, button press visual and feedback. So here's one thing that, that is a little different with Touch Portal than it is with Stream Deck. With Stream Deck, you've got a, a, a tactical button you're pushing, right? Stream Deck, seen Touch Portal do this, and they tried to come up with an app too, but theirs is like five bucks a month instead of Touch Portal being $13 for life. Um, so it's a little bit more pricey. Um, then they seen, oh, Touch Portal, done, we need an app to do it too. But the Stream Deck buttons are nice because they are tactical buttons. With this, remind you that you're using a touchscreen device, right? So the tactical feedback doesn't seem to be there as good. However, what you can do is make the button kind of, they, they kind of, what they call it, squeeze, I think. So when you hit it, the button goes like, so it kind of recesses and comes back at you to let you know you hit it. You can also tell it to vibrate when you hit it for a little bit of tactical feedback too, but it's not, it's still, in my opinion, it's still not as gratifying as hitting a button and it's sinking in, clicking, come back in, right? So it doesn't have that. So that is one thing, but I mean, 13 bucks versus 250 bucks, you know, it's a big difference, right? Um, and how it works. So you see all these integrated surface uh, services that are already in it. And if you scroll down, you can see Discord, Spotify, Voice Meter. Voice Meter is another great one that people use with OBS and stuff to be able to control your voice, you control different mics, you can actually make yourself sound like I'm the man or whatever, make it deep or whatever, you know, versus whatever. You can make yourself sound high pitch, you can change your, your, your stuff. But this is just scratching the surface. This is in Logitech keys, right? So that goes back to working with those Logitech devices we were just talking about. Uh, Windows Essentials, so it can monitor your RAM and your CPU and stuff for you too. Um, again, it goes back to this is what they kind of say works and that you can do plugins for just right out of the box, but it is not the, the only thing you can do with, right? Again, this is the, the mind is the imagination. Um, I'll pull mine up and just give you a, a look at some of my decks that I have and some of my pages I have. Um, here is the, the pricing, I think, down here that I was talking about. Um, so let's just you know these are the add-ins. So this, some people have already created stuff, so you don't have to create buttons, and you can actually add these straight in and plug them straight into your stuff. Um, so if you want Spotify and all that stuff, these are just free downloads. Uh, yeah. So okay, they bumped it up a dollar. Inflation hit this too. <laughs> Go figure. It's not twelve ninety nine anymore. It's thirteen ninety nine. But that gives you the pro upgrade and it's unlimited. Right, and you get icon packages you can download and pay for, but you don't have to use them. You can make your own icons, just as simple as you know, getting a PNG file and and you know, turning the back alpha and bringing it in. Right, so you can do all that stuff with it. So that is the pricing. That is Touch Portal. I'm going to pull my Touch Portal up just real quick. Um, let's see, where are you? Uh, I know I didn't load it. I'll just kind of show you some of the cool stuff I've done here. And again, I'm still in my infancy with this. Uh, that's fine. Whatever. Go away, go away, go away. <laughs> Hopefully it's going to read it. It might not because I don't have my stuff plugged in. Okay, yeah, I did. So this is my home page that I use, and it's just got a lot of my company stuff that we have, our body engineering, kind of our, our um, charts that shows people's work and stuff. Um, so this is my shortcut button. This is something that we created in-house. It's a pretty cool button. It goes like that right there, and I can create shortcuts here. So that's another, you know, like a mouse wheel for us in a way, but it works in any application. 
um, some more programs. Swim is our SolidWorks there. SolidWorks there it takes you straight to Zoom. Um, you got GIMP, who uses GIMP. I love it. It's just a free software to, to modify your photos and stuff, OBS, different things here. So what happens is you come in here and you create all these different ones. Uh, let's go to my SolidWorks one, for example. Here's SolidWorks. I've got the button in the middle. That, that's going to open SolidWorks for me, right? Um, I've got a lot of things. Flash my tree. Yeah, it's easy. It's Shift-C, but, you know, why not? have a button. I can just take my hand off my mouse and point at real quick. Right, section model. I just got all these different ones, and I kind of put them in the order of what's closer to my hand, what I use more often, right? And then maybe the ones I don't use as often, maybe a little bit further up in the, the body of the the screen, just because I don't, I can don't have to go over there as many times, right? Open drawings. Um, so that's just that one. To create a button, it's pretty simple. You, you click on it, you go in here, and, and you tell it what you want it to do. Um, you can run a program, start an application. Uh, you got your, your navigation, go to a page or a URL. I'm not gonna go through all these, but I'll just kind of do some basic stuff. Here's if you wanna make key inputs, right? So you know you're, you're typing the same thing every time for something, well, hit a button and let it type it for you. Another really cool feature about this when it comes to, uh, okay, so mouse click, you can do your mouse click. What I really like about this, and this is a cool feature I haven't seen on anything else, is let's say I'm I'm pretty uh, pretty standard, I guess, when it comes to my screen. Well, I don't say come into my screen because you see my screens at the beginning. I got them everywhere where I sit, but where I put my applications on my screens are always the same, right? That way I know you know Outlook's over here, SolidWorks is in front of me, our PDMs on my right hand side, right, and my my spreadsheets up here, and so everything kind of the same. And because of being a creature of habit in that sense. I can actually say use mouse button position. And if there is a button that needs to be clicked by the mouse and there's no other way to get to it, I can tell it to do that and it'll record my mouse position and the click at that point. Now the button on that screen, not only does that, but I can set uh, other features or other things post that mouse button click, right? So maybe I need to click that button and I need to type a name and an address or whatever and then hit save. Right or enter would be saved, maybe who knows. I can now hit that button and it automatically clicks in that space and starts filling out that information. Who knows? Sometimes I've used it because I might be in SolidWorks, but now I need to be over here in this application and a text field, and it'll go to that text field and go ahead and click into that text field and go ahead and type in what I needed it to type in because it's a redundant operation. Right? So that's pretty cool. Again, this is a new one I'm, I'm kind of passionate about. I really think it's really neat. It's a good opportunity for a lot of people to be able to use and create macros just in crazy ways. Um, we talked about, you know, my Outlook, right, open box and stuff like that. It really realizes that I'm there uh, or whether it's in Zoom. So you guys kind of seen that as well, right? All right, we did say we were going to jump in SolidWorks just for a second. The only reason I was doing this was just to show you guys that the hotkeys do live here. I've got to get rid of this Zoom bar so I can get to it. Uh, I'm messing with my Brad's mouse and I'm hitting the wrong button. <laughs> Paybacks, ain't it? <laughs> yeah, yesterday he was doing the same thing. He's using my computer for his presentation. He's like, hey, your hotkey isn't normal. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> so yeah, you come in here, you go to customize, and if you come over to your keyboard shortcuts, you can actually say, okay, what commands do I want to use for it? Or you can say all commands, or you could say, you know, commands with keyboard shortcuts, uh, commands with keyboard shortcuts. You can print this list out, post it, use it to fill out your hotkeys that you need to use, or fill out your, uh, your macro pad buttons or your touch portal buttons, all that kind of stuff, right? Sorry, and I came back to that because I said I would. All right. Here's some more stuff with Touch Portal. This is kind of showing you some of the stuff I just went in and showed you myself and how to create things. And you link your executable file so you can have it open things, uh, change your background, put borders around it, change the pictures, do all that crazy stuff to it.
All right, so miscellaneous peripheral devices, um, the Logitech C920 camera that I've got at 70 bucks. It's just kind of going through some of the other stuff that was in that picture that I didn't get into in the presentation. Um, I use these Wii lights, RGB, Bluetooth lights. I have two of them set up. So when I'm on any meeting or presentations, it's illuminating both sides of my face. Because when you have one direct light at you, you might get a shadow on one side versus the other. So that way I'm covering both sides. Um, 32 inch curved monitors, those were great. Uh, story on those real quick is uh, Walmart had the first 32 inch monitor on Black Friday for like hundred bucks. I said, there's no way I can pass that up. I got it. The next one I got, I got from Best Buy and it was a matching one. And the only reason I got that is because I had some Best Buy gift cards from Christmas. And I said, okay, I got to use these. Let's get another monitor to match that monitor, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, it's just some, some pictures. I do use the, the USB condenser microphone. I've got a couple of those. I've got one that's on an arm. I don't use it as much unless I'm doing presentations out in public and doing more professional type Zoom stuff. I use this condenser mic actually for just everyday use at my computer. That's the, uh, the way light, um, lights that I use. They not only go to a remote control and plug in for, for power, you can, they run on a battery too, but you can also control it from an app on your phone. So that's nice. And you can adjust, really cool because you can adjust the light and the colors of the light and tune, tune in your, your white balance a little bit better that way. But you can also, uh, if you want to mess with somebody, it'll do strobes of red and blue so you can think the cops are coming down the road after you. <laughs> Pretty interesting. That's the monitors, some more stuff here. So yeah, just some general notes you may have taken or that you could probably take real quick or jot them down in your head that um, may help you come back and remember this, that devices can make your job easier. Use them, learn to use them, add them in a little bit of time. You don't have to dump all of it on yourself at once and overwhelm yourself, just one at a time. Hot key buttons can make your life more efficient, your job more efficient, right? And using those with macro buttons does the same thing. Using device, using devices outside the box for productivity. So like I spoke with the Stream Deck, uh, as well as Touch Portal, I didn't use those the way they were intended. They're kind of the way they're intended, but way outside the scope of what most people use them for. I brought it into the engineering world and said, this is cool, it'll work. So think about that in the future. Uh, macros and logic are our friends. So I like to always call everybody to action as giving it a try doing one thing at a time if you can, and where will you start? Old ways won't open new doors. Make a habit of trying new things. And practice doesn't make perfect, but practice makes habit. And I love to repeat this. I used it at one of my presentations already this week, but Aristotle said, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then, is not an act, but a habit. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, transfer profiles from uh, the deck lab. Can you copy and send those to people? That are not so yes, you can export your pages and stuff. You sure can. The only thing you have to be wary of, I'm not 100% sure with Stream Deck, but I know Touch Portal does, and I would think Stream Deck does the same thing. Software is probably similar. The one thing you have to be considerate of when you do that is say you have a certain executable or file location is that there's matches because the mapping needs to be the same for certain things. But like, for example, if if you had control C as, as copy, but your buddy had control C as cut, well, when he gets your profile and he uses that button, it's gonna do what his cells do versus what yours said do. Because control C is independent by the, by the independent or the user, right? Great question. Any other questions? So uh, personally, I'm a husband and a dad. I'm, I do motorcycle ministry. Uh, encourager of beards, and actually am a t-shirt seller as well. So first things first, what is a configuration? So anybody know what a configuration is inside of SolidWorks? I know the VARs do. Well, Adam does. Oh, there we go. A configuration allows a user to maintain multiple versions of a part or multiple variations of a part uh, in a single file. So it gives you a little bit of 
uh, flexibility in your design so you're not having to do multiple file management. Um, it could be set by length or by dimension values or features that are suppressed or even things like opening and closing or changing mates so it looks like different so it looks differently so extend and retract and don't have dog cylinders doors being open and closed and buildings uh you know pins you know different number of pins and connectors you can set those as well so so what are the benefits of it well like i said before we can have variations minor variations of the same part in the same file so you're not having to maintain multiple files for you know something that's relatively the same and we'll um, jump over to our uh, was it adam call it the cab mobile yesterday all right so here we are got ourselves a motor adapter plate now in my first um, design career i did nothing but these every day all day different motor adapter plates. And there's only so many ways you can design one of these and it not be boring. So we figured out how to do uh, configurations and we actually figured out how to do it via macros using the configuration. So I could just hit a button and it would auto design it myself. Whole different topic, but we're just kind of go create a, uh, create a configuration and kind of show you what we can do with variations. So, um, so over here in your uh, feature tree, is you know all the things that are comprised of that part so uh, the body the extrudes and as you can see we got some things named in here i know one of our guys on our chat loves to name everything inside of his models so we've got some that are named and some that are you know don't don't hate me too much um chris but um these are things that can be changed variables inside of that uh inside of the configurations everything up to and including the sketch dimensions we can always change. Okay. So we're gonna click over this middle tab here and this opens up your configuration pane. We'll drag it out a little bit so everybody can see it a little bit and you can read all the stuff here. Every file will have a default configuration. Now, some companies um, will make you change them so it doesn't say default, it might be a part number, it might be extend or retract but natively to the software, it will be a default. Um, and that's where uh, the software starts. So we're gonna go right click up in the top and we're gonna add a configuration and we could just name it any way we want. So we're just gonna call this big and you can always change it up to whatever you want. And you can actually add a sub description. So big modification. And if I wanted to put that description specifically inside the build materials, I can actually click that button that's highlighted over here uh, that I selected and actually show that. So if you have two different configurations in an assembly, you can pick the one you want to use. Same thing down at the bottom. If you have a um, part number, unique part number for that configuration, you could put, you could pick up the, the configuration name where I can add a, you know, part numbers. We're just going to call up, you know, one zero 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 zero. You can put your own part number in. So we're gonna go ahead and just create our configuration. As you can see, it pulls it up and actually gives you your part number that can be shown in your prints on that as well. Um, now you can come in here and you can change what gets seen. Uh, so your tree display is, you can actually go in here and say, that's that des description that I put in. So if you have some mo unique modification you want somebody to know about that comes in or you know, ten years ten years later, you open up something and you go, okay, what? Why did I create this? You didn't actually have a note, kind of in there as to why you did it. So, you know, use them as as needed. Um, but here we have two configurations that are identical, right? Now we can come in here. Let's let's uh, let's have some fun with it. This requires some user participation, so we're going to speak up. Uh, please speak up if you can. We're going to change these dimensions that are highlighted. Uh, three inches now it could be um any size of that is larger than three we're going to go bigger so um we're going to come in here we're going to right click that dimension and you can actually come down here and pick what configuration you want it to be what, what you want it to be so for this configuration i want this dimension to be what so give me a number seven seven so 
Now we have a, a change. So we're going to use our control B function. Adam, your control B is not rebuild. Uh, control Q, rebuild. There. Um, control B on a default program rebuilds just that thing, except Adam's computer, who is an anomaly. <laughs> so, yes, Adam the anomaly. So, if I did this correctly, we switch back and forth between the configurations, it's still the same part. The dimensions just changed. It is still something that you can maintain. You can have as many configurations as you want to a file. In fact, our company has a bolt configuration file that's got 100 different configurations in it. You can drop that one bolt in, change the configuration, get the right bolt you need. So it kind of gives you a little bit of flexibility. So we're gonna come back in here and do, a, do a, another modification. So we're gonna click this dimension. Ah. I'm on now, there we go. Right click your dimension, configure dimension, and you can actually come in here and do it here as well in this configure dimension display. So I can come in here and actually modify it in both configurations at the same time. So what's, what dimension do you want there? We got seven on that on the horizontal axis. What do you want for the vertical axis? I need a cricket sound effect on my stream deck. 10? Okay. So, Again, the dimensions changed just in that one configuration. Just kind of gives you an idea of, you know, you can vary your parts. You can keep all those parts inside this one file for prototyping or if you're doing one-off one -off design. Um, and it you know, just kind of lets you play around a little bit if you're, if you're doing that. So, I mean, even, even as much as changing your uh, bolt patterns and things, we can all go in here and change that stuff. So we'll, we'll kind of skip on here. Um, to the next one. So, um, anybody who's familiar with sheet metal, sheet metal, I'm sure. No, Adam's not. Okay. So we're going to open up a sheet metal part here. Did you know that your flat pattern in a sheet metal file is actually a configuration of the default? So when you create a sheet metal part and you flatten it in the software it creates what is called a derived configuration. That configuration is based solely off the one above it. It's not unique. So you can create as many config regular configurations as you would like, but you can also derive further down into it and create sub-derivative um, configurations underneath it. Gives you infinite possibilities to work and play and prototype what you have and what you want to get. So your flat pattern is a derived configuration. So if I decide I wanted to change my base flange length, we'll just go ahead and call this, uh, make this box 10 inches by eight, rebuild. Got a bigger box now. Your, con your flat pattern updates accordingly. So it's because it's actually derived from the top configuration of the parent inside of the software um, and it, that can kind of go into uh, creating your prints as well so when you you want to do a print for a drawing right you're going to send are you going to send the sheet metal bender the guy who's going to make it you want to send him a you know a view of the box no well i can come in here change my configuration to the flat pattern Dimension my flat pattern however I want, and get rid of the views I don't need. Throw another view in. We'll just kind of, uh, we'll throw a left side view in and kind of give you the dimensions. Take that. Where's your projected view, Adam? This is what happens when you don't use your own settings. Uh huh. So I can actually come in here. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. See what he's doing? He's making it hard on me during the presentation. So you can come in here and actually throw all the views you need to, but it's just the same file. It keeps everything inside those two files, the drawing and the part. So it allows you to continually work um, 
and keep everything linked together so you're not having to create an AutoCAD flat DXF every time you want to have a laser cut part, you can get it off this print as well. Um, inside of, how many people know what that is on the screen? Ghostbusters? That's it. It is the Ghostbusters trap. We can also use configurations to move parts around. No, I know, you're gonna call. But, you know, you can't catch a ghost with it, with it closed, right? Well, if I'm gonna prototype this part for Egon and all them guys who are gonna make it, I want them to be able to see it open. Come on now. So they can see how it opens and closes just by, you can change the mates in your configurations by suppressing and uh, unsuppressing mates. We can you know, change the things we need to show what we'd like inside of those, inside of those parts. So I don't have to have two separate mo models here to open and close it. I'm, I'm glad somebody actually got this reference. I taught this in a high school class a couple months ago. Nobody knew what this was. It made me feel really old. So, ooh, yeah, that's a good one. That'd be a good one. Plastic forming or something, rotary foam. So, um, we kind of went over how to create the configurations. We kind of did some show and tell. All right, best practices. We're going to kind of go into some best practices. Um, assemblies, component location change. So, if you're moving, extending, retracting, folding doors open in that Ghostbusters trap. That's a great use of configurations um, for assemblies. For parts, you want to keep them significantly similar. So if I'm modeling this microphone and I want to change the length of this, okay, that's good. But if I want to change the length of this, the size of the, the condenser on the end and the button location, it's probably better to create a new part file because they're not significantly similar anymore. That's kind of a, a best practice that we've implemented across our company because we don't want to have something that's a round part, have a configuration that's square or rectangle or hexagon or whatever. So, but it is not for hide show components. I see this all the time with new users or even people who are just too lazy. What's a better option? Display states. We'll go, to, we'll go into that. So, it's not for hide show components. I see this all the time though. Somebody will create a configuration to hide a, a plate so you can see inside. Not for that. Because if you're gonna use that in a print, every configuration you have in that model that you throw on the print, it's gonna cause that model to download another time to open the drawing. So if you have five configurations in the same print, it's having to load and view those five different files at the same time. Not to mention the rebuild time. Rebuild times as well. If you do display states, it only has to load that model one time, and it's just showing different things hidden and shown. So, and there's a way to go in and change the rebuild on the configuration without not rebuild everything. Yes. Even when you go in and try to rebuild something, it's going to rebuild. That's correct. You could actually do some settings in there so it won't rebuild every time. But um, to do display states, let's say I don't want to show this button here or this, you know, the switch. I don't have to go over here and create a configuration to hide this. I can come in here and create a display state. I can rename it to whatever I'd like. So we're going to come in here and we're going to change it to button re uh, switch removed. Come on now. There we go. This actually allows you here to hide new components. Say if I um, come in here later and add another part in and I have this selected, it'll automatically hide that in that specific display state. It kind of allows um, a little flexibility. And you can also link them to configurations as well if you wanted to get a little bit more fancy with it. But we're going to have one with switch removed and we can come in here and actually hide that. Where's it at? Put that switch or control knob. So we're going to hide that, come on now, there it is, in that display state. Well, I can switch back and forth between those two display states 
without having to switch back and forth between the configurations. So when I go in to actually make a new drawing of this ghost catcher, when I go in to throw my part in, I can throw in my isometric view. And then inside the view drawing, I could say I want it to be closed or open, but I also have this display state function down here so I can hide and show the parts that's needed. So it kind of um, allows you to show the things you need, hide the things you need inside of an assembly. So if you're doing something that's really complicated, you want to have internal views and things. It keeps you from having to do cutout views or additional section views or these weird auxiliary views of section views of details so that you're not confusing the guy who's trying to actually make the part. You can show them a little bit better uh, of a way. So um, more show and tell. I'm going to show you one of my horrendous models that I created years ago, and I'm going to show you how bad it is. So take this with a grain of salt. Do not do this. Look at the feature tree. How many of us look back five, ten years? Ago? Yeah. Look at all this. All these suppressed parts, right? But this looks complete, right? Well, that's because it's a correct configuration for a left-handed digger, for a large derrick, for Altec. Well, if I wanted to switch that configuration, well, it's telling me I can't because I don't have to. I don't have to. I have to load that part again. And see, it's trying to rebuild every time to find the right components. As you can see, it's not working because I don't have all those parts downloaded. It's moving things around as needed, but it's not pulling the stuff appropriately because I have too many things in there. I've created this monster that every time I open this actual file in our company network, I have to download every part that's in this feature trade before I can modify a single thing. And as you see, there's hundreds of mates, hundreds of them suppressed, unsuppressed, red, yellow. This thing's awful. And I'm ashamed that I actually created this, but I thought I was doing something good. There's one file to maintain. Hooray. Now we've got problems. Now every time somebody modifies this, they're sitting here, what do I do now? This part's not downloaded. I have to go back into my PDM, download that part, fix whatever mates there are, save it back in, and open the drawing. Oh no, something's not shown right. Redownload the thing. It just adds extra time. This was a bad use of configurations, and now everybody who touches this is having to pay for it. So learn from my mistakes. Please don't do it. Only do things that are significantly similar, like the width of a part or the length of a part or a set of bolts that are all quarter inch diameter, just different lengths. That's the, the best case or the best practices use of the configurations. It's something that, you know, we all struggle with is we try to get things to do it faster and make it better. But in the end, it ends up biting us in the foot later when somebody who's only been using software six months opens it up and says, uh, what do I do with these parts that are in here? They'll come back in and start deleting things. I don't need these. I don't need these. I come back six months later and I go to open a configuration. Nothing's there. I just made extra work for myself because I was trying to be slick. So do better for, than me. <laughs> this was done my first year at Altec and now we're stuck with it because <laughs> our PLM won't let us change it. So something to kind of think about as you're doing configurations. So that's a very good best practice. I heard the mic unmute. Does somebody have a question? Configurations keep additional resources and either local save time or save time to PC, Team Center, PLM. Yes, it does. Because you're creating additional data, large amounts of additional data. The question came from Chris Rock. Yes. So the question was do configurations eat additional resources? Yes. Like we said earlier, in your drawings, every time you have a configuration that's loaded in a different view, it's going to have to re-download that model from somewhere and show it differently. 
And you can save time in your downloads and stuff by downloading only what's needed. However, yes, you got to pay the piper somewhere because if you want to change yes. that configuration, you have to download it later rather than now. So, yes, you can save time, but at the same time, as you're saving time, you hurt yourself in the back end because if you ever change again, yeah, if you ever change that configuration, yes, like you mentioned earlier, Brad, you have to go down. Yes. So here's so if you look at these configurations over here in the left, these X's denote that they're not going to update until I tell them to. So these probably were put in by somebody who knows that these parts are now going to be obsoleted. That specific configuration is obsoleted. It's not going to update or download any of those files that's needed until I force it to reload. Um, so, so let's see. I do not believe it is in this one here. Oh, yeah. So you have to add it to rebuild here. Again, I've taken it off rebuild. That's going to keep it from updating every time I save it. So we're going to take take it away. Oh, yes, Chris, if you would like to add a verbal comment, un just unmute. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. So uh, uh, when I first started out, I transferred, transferred over to SolidWorks. Uh, the configuration display, th display state had me a little baffled at first. And I remember the... I called SolidWorks, um, and one of the comments they made to me, and it's always stuck with me that's really helped, is that configurations are for the bomb or suppression or unsuppression. Uh, to where display states is visual materials, hide, unhide. So yes. I always think of configurations as I'm driving something. So yes, a display state that is correct. I'm not. That's good. Can anybody, did everybody hear that? Okay, so configurations, so we'll repeat it so everybody can hear it. Configurations are for the bomb, display states are for the drawing. So if configurations for, um, you know, draw, driving different parts, the display states are so you can. Suppression, yes. unsuppression, and bomb. Yes, Un suppression, unsuppression, and bomb. And display states are just for viewer, easier of assembly, and that kind of thing. So, yes, that was good. That was good. Yes, there's you can have, you can exclude from bomb and things later. That can be in a little bit more advanced topic for like envelopes and stuff like that. So, um, but in the interest of time, so we don't go over and these lovely people can go. Um, so my call to action for you guys is practice it. So if you're creating something that's similar looking, prototyping, well, let's try to practice it. Create your own configurations. Create sheet metal parts. That's really easy because it already creates a configuration for you. That flat pattern is a configuration. Um, share it with, with your teams. If you're, especially uh, college students, if you are out there and you're working on stuff and there's you know issues that they're having, you can open that part, modify it a little bit, resave it as a separate configuration, and try it in the model. And try it in an assembly and see if it worked better than having to sit there, open a part, create part, and redesign the whole thing from scratch. Um, and then ask me questions anytime. So at, we're going to do a Q&A, and then afterwards I'll display my uh, content information. And I, you know, um, I like to answer questions and give support over the phone uh, from from a user for a user. That's what user groups are for. Yes, TriMec is a great. Uh, great VAR, all of our VARs are great. They, they have a super good support network. But asking questions from users in specific use cases will get you something, uh, not only the camaraderie of working with other users, but you can find better ways of doing things. Uh, the ways to speed up your workflows, the ways to make, even make drawings more simpler, simply, or, you know, it, it, it builds a community around it. So that's what we're trying to do here at Software Future Groups. So uh, questions about anything, um, I like to call this the stump to chump section. If you've got a SOLIDWORKS design question or anything specific about the this uh, presentation. I think one of the things that, that I've uh, made a mess in the past is the uh, changing dimensions on configurations. Yes, uh, changing dimensions are. There's a little button on the modify dimensions that if you're not careful and you leave it at all configurations, you can change the dimension and it'll change on everything. Yes. So make sure that whenever you change those dimensions, you're only changing it on the, the configurations that you're wanting to change it on, not everything. Yes. So you can come down here and say, I want to modify this configuration 
all configurations or specify the ones I want to modify. Right. Yes, that's a good one. I like that one. Yeah, that's a good that's a good tip. Always make sure it's your if you're going to change one for a configuration that you specifically change that dimension only in that one, or if you accidentally leave it as all, you'll you know the dimension will stay across all of them. So it'd be something to look at if you're having issues with flipping back and forth. Just make sure you got that selection. That's a good that's a good tip. I like that. Those configurations to communicate with each other independently. So, if you change one dimension, let's say um, vertical dimension, you change it from three to seven, uh, the tolerance is in between the mounting the actual holes. Uh, These corner. can those tolerances stay consistent relative to the, the vertical one? Yes, what you would have to do then is do an equation based off of this dimension number or you would set this as a global variable you could set that as like variable a and variable a in each configuration will control the diameter of that bulb circle you just have it say you know do the do the equation to calculate it but yes it, it's it's doable that's how that's how we, we worked our macros is it um it, you know it would always automatically create a plane and then it would extrude so far and then after the extrusion, it would take a tenth of that, it would divide that extrusion number and then do a cut that deep so you have your pilot face and then it would do a cut through. It, was, it would do that yeah. calculation. I remember working on a start part. One of the guys in my team was actually the one working on a start part, but it had this slope bottom shelf. It was basically for a bunch of drawers to go into it. It's divided, but we had slot and tab scored, tab and slots, whatever you want to call it, yeah. um, for different uh, shelving spacing and height mm -hmm. and all that stuff. But the fact that it was angled was what made it a lot more, uh, a lot more intense to modify. But we had to wrap all kinds of global variables around it, equations and all that stuff, because if a user wanted to go in and say, now I want this this long with this many dividers then i had to go in and calculate all that and, and mm -hmm. also calculate the slope from when you went to the depth and when we went to the depth that angle might not be the same yeah i might have to pull that angle up and, yep. yeah 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 so it, it it will it will involve a little bit more um practice with your global variables and um your equations which is good if you're planning on going and taking your certification exams for the cswp because that one requires global variables and equations CSW doesn't require global variables. But it makes it easier. Yes, doesn't require them, but it makes it easier. So pro tip, if you're going to take them, practice those first. And the reason that the, the P really requires it is because time, as you get more focused in those certifications, time is everything on those. Variables. Yes, correct. Yep. So good question. Good question. Any more? Brad? Yes. Uh, I, I would like to add, too. Um, just your presentation because like where you showed the arm uh, for the digger uh, to where you had multiple variations. So a lot of times here, just from a different perspective where I'm not doing a configuration of the same thing, I may use mm -hmm. configurations to a flex model for the customer uh, or B make a configuration for things so they're flexible so that I could move things for the customer. Yes. Uh, that's, a, that's a good one. But but we do a lot of one off custom here, right? So so I'm not a lot of times I'm not making configurations for many of similar items, but I'm making configurations in my assembly just to help with drawings to where I can detail in more detail or better, you know, for the shop or something like that. So there's that use for them too. There's, it, you know, it's not just a um, kind of like that digger where it's the same, but it changes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and based on whatever PLM or PDM software your company is using, if you're not using one, configurations will be immensely helpful in all kinds of ways. But if sometimes the PLM, PDM software is limit to what you can do with configurations, and that's kind of where we run into specifically at our, our, at our facilities is our team center PLM software. Once you create a configuration of a part through a file, you cannot break it like bark. So I can't break this assembly up into all these different sub assemblies anymore because it breaks everything instead of team center. So we have, we're stuck modifying this. Granted is probably this, this model was downloaded to my, to them for this presentation two years ago. So I'm sure it's even more wrecked now, <laughs> but it, you know, kind of, um, 
kind of limits you based on, you know, your company work practices and things. So that's a good, that was a good one. Yes. Any more? 